Here we go. Welcome everybody to another Ember stream. Yeah, it's time to get psyched. It's time to get psyched. Uh, remember how I told you guys that I was gonna like hold back some art? Time to get psyched uh, for the I Kickstarter. Told you guys well, that I was gonna like hold back some art for the Kickstarter. Well, I, I've sort of like half changed my mind. I'm gonna be showing you incremental art, as uh, you know, some of the stuff we've we've been working on. And there's other stuff too. Uh, how much we will reveal before Kickstarter, I'm not sure yet. But I wanted to show you some of the important work that was happening. So today we are discussing, of course, the Tihu, which are the penultimate enemy of Gate Striders in the story of Ember. Ember, of course, is the planet that you are hoping to terraform and colonize into your new homeworld for the MMO that we are making. So we have something to show you, uh, you today, and we're going to split... In two halves. I'm gonna I'm gonna talk first, and uh, we'll do a little cheap chat stuff, and then uh, Harry's gonna stream. Harry's gonna gonna um, uh, be, uh, you know, come to think of it, I could probably do this on on Twitch as well. But we have it set up, and we have our sort of jury rig system where Harry uh, Harry's going to be streaming the technology he's been working on for the new locomotion system for the Tsihu. And you know, we make a new the reason why we're making a whole new animation system for the Tihu is because the player system is too complicated for NPCs, too heavyweight, because we want players to do a lot of things and look really cool. It's got to be really general purpose and stuff. But for the uh, the NPCs, we need a more uh, a, a more simplified system. And the system we were using, the guys that you've seen in the demos up till now, really haven't cut the mustard in terms of quality. You know how they slide and skate everywhere and uh, and the thumper turns in a funky way. And we don't really have control over that because that's like a third party piece of code that we use for NPCs to control their animations. And we decided, hey, we need more control. We're gonna ha go ahead and make our own. So Harry's been hard at work on that and he's gonna show you the fruits of his labor eventually. Uh, all right, so let me see, can I, can I get my There we go. Made Grums is back. Hello, everyone. Right over the Ember logo. Yeah, that's great placement. I know you guys have missed me. I don't know what was up when I was running the... Uh, so last week we ran the... Ne we we're running on Unreal Engine 5, right? So one thing I want to point out is everything you see here is real-time rendered in Unreal 5. This is the new Lumen lighting system that you see. And this is our Neko uh, character, our Feli character. In the lore of Ember, they're called Felis. Fellies were genetically engineered, of course, by Elon Musk uh, a long time ago. And no, not really. Elon never gave us permission to say that. But anyways, in order to survive in their harsh zero gravity environment, because their colony pla uh, planet was toxic, they evolved into sort of these, uh, they needed sort of acrobatic abilities. They needed abilities to treat any sort of zero G surface as the floor. And what better creature to have those sort of dexterous skills than cats. And so, of course, this is the long tortured explanation for why there are Nekos in Ember, but I'm sure you will all nudge, nudge, wink, wink, go along with me on that one, right? Can I wink? Yeah, wink, wink, nudge, can I nudge? I can't really nudge. Okay, how's everyone feeling today, huh? How's everyone feeling? I'm looking at I'm looking at chat here. You know I should go to Twitch chat here. Let me let me fire that up. And I'm gonna put this on uh, I'm gonna put this on Twitter so people know that we're we're broadcasting here. Oh my gosh, I opened Twitch and there's someone recommended Amarath's ASMR thing and she's sucking on a microphone here. This is Twitch now. Maybe it's time to move to YouTube. Or or I need to get into this ASMR stuff with my VTuber Abby. I don't know, you tell me. What's going to be more successful? I, I've heard of chewing on the mic. Sucking on the mic is new. <laughs> yeah, we are streaming. We are on Twitch right now. And I just got recommended. Uh, the, the first time I've got been recommended one of these ASMR, uh, uh, spicy ASMR streams. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, let me tweet this out here. Let people know what's going on. And while we're waiting, is uh, anybody excited to see the this little reveal today? The not so little little reveal. <laughs> I know we've had a lot of requests to see some of what's going on behind the scenes, so today would be a good day. Yeah, yeah. we've been we've been doing a lot of that. We've been uh, sharing with you guys our experiments with nanite, and you know we did say that uh, we were going to try for an optimized build of the nanite terrain system. Uh, today, but you know, I was doing more tests this week, and uh, you know, we have. Uh, I don't know what the performance issues are. I don't know what's holding it back, and so we are currently exploring that. Uh, like I said, Nanite may not be the solution for us uh, because we want to run on lower end PCs. And right now, if you are in the demo, which you all eligible backers can download that Nanite demo. By the way, if you haven't already, I highly recommend you check it out. And you can pop into, make sure you're in hangar A. If you are in hangar B or in hangar C, when you spawn in, you will not see nanite terrain and you will have to fly. You have to fly to the A spawn point, base A, home base A. So definitely check it out. But uh, yeah, the frame rate is is not glorious. The frame rate has has some issues, and because of the the way Ember is, there's two reasons why I'm concerned about that. Uh, one is, well, first of all, going to Unreal Five is great anyways because we're actually using Unreal Five stuff for some of the animation technology that you're going to be seeing later on the stream today. But as far as Nanite is concerned, I do have some concerns that I share with you guys. Uh, about performance because we have massive sort of invasions going on and we need high frame rate to push those sort of numbers. And we, um, and you know, doing the thing where we paper mache the terrain with thousands of mesh, you know, zillion poly mesh decals, basically, not decals, but, uh, but jigsaw puzzle pieces. Yeah, it's like paper mache over the terrain with jigsaw puzzle pieces. That's not, that's not working so well. I just got to say that up front. Now, maybe we're missing something. And of course, this is the beta version of Unreal 5. It's not even released yet. You can expect more performance improvements later. But as far as terrain goes, we have our doubts. And we've been we've been struggling with that kind of for the past uh, two days here. Harry and I have been running performance tests and trying different things, reducing overdraw, all this sort of stuff. And we can't uh, seem to get it to be much more performant than it was in the build. If you have a fast video card, it works. If you don't have a fast video card, the performance quickly degrades, and it doesn't hold up at like 4K resolutions or anything like that. But I think Nanite is the future. You're going to see, if for single player games, Nanite's going to be phenomenal, and you're going to see some really incredible games made with UE5 and Nanite. So, um, but the other thing we're going to explore for Nanite is, of course, uh, using uh, it for the frames. And for hard surfaces and bases, it should work well for that. But again, it's going to require more tests. So I'll probably put together some more tests. And it's really good to run those tests by the community because you guys have uh, a variety of machine machines and we could tell how well it's working on those. All right. So the other reason is, of course, uh, the GPU crisis has not abated. For a while, I thought that, you know, since the cryptocurrency ban in China happened, that we'd see GPU prices fall, and they did fall for a little while, and then they sprang right back up. And uh, while there is availability, you can go buy these cards now. I think if you want a 2060, it's going to be 600 bucks at current pricing. And it is unclear whether that pricing is going to come down. NVIDIA's 4000 series cards are shipping soon. And the rumor is, is that they might ship at the inflated prices. Uh, we don't know yet. That's, that's just rumor. But GPU prices might be here to stay because the market will bear it, right? People are still scooping up these cards. I don't know who they are. Maybe they're crypto miners or who knows what. Scientific purposes, you know, a lot of tensor cores get used for AI research. 
Uh, but I don't see prices coming down in, with the 4000 series. And the, the date keeps push, be, is, is pushed back more and more. They say that, oh, at the end of this year, the prices will fall. And now they're saying, well, it's probably going to last until the tail end of next year. They are have to, they're having to build more fabs, which are the factories that build GPU chips. So it's not looking good, guys. It's not looking good for GPUs. And so I think it might be safe to assume that whatever GPU you have now, you'll be holding on to it for a little while longer. And if that's the case, then we have to be especially careful about, of course, Ember system specs. So this is why, you know, please bear with us. This is why we've been doing so much testing with Nanite. This is why we've been uh, having you guys try experimental builds is because we don't want to put you guys into a situation where the game doesn't run well for you, right? So even though we're excited about the new technology and everything else, it's, it's got to run well for you. Now, that doesn't mean that when Ember ships that, you know, your 980, your 970 card is necessarily going to be the low end. It's probably going to be a 1060, according to everything we've been in, in our talks with NVIDIA. But, uh, but yeah, GPU prices are not coming down. And if you want to be min spec for Ember, I think it's safe to say you'll want to be at around a 1060. So if you see a good price on a used 1060, you can go snag it. Don't get the three gigabyte version card of the 1060. There's three and then there's uh, six. Definitely opt for the six. It makes a huge difference in game performance. So if you're going to upgrade to a 1060, yeah, 1060 is the most popular GPU and it's gaining. It gained another 1.7% last month, according to Steam survey. So yeah, don't, don't get the three gigabyte version. You'll be very sad. If you're going to, if you're going to upgrade and, and you're, you're you know, you can't make the leap to a 2000 or a 3000 series card, um, you know, but you got, you got a good lead. You got a good lead on a 1060 that you can get for cheap from a friend or something, then who's upgrading, then definitely get the six, six gigabyte version. Okay. So, uh, GPU talk. Yeah. I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos and uh, people who watch the markets for GPUs and things. And that's something I've got my mind on. So UE5, maybe Nanite isn't right for us for terrain. We're going to try it out for uh, the frames and hard surfaces like the weapons. That should be uh, a lot better. And for bases, it could be it could be a phenomenal technology for bases. That's something we have to try out for our Kickstarter movie because uh, bases will be in the movie, but not in the playable mockup. And of course, the lighting system. So this is Lumen that you see here. Lumen is their new... Uh, high-end lighting solution for Unreal, and that's something that we'd like to check out. Obviously, we could, you know, uh, turn Lumen on and off selectively, so maybe in photo mode and things like that. We've been talking about that, about 4K textures and photo mode stuff, so it looks like this. What you're seeing right here now is rendered in Unreal 5, and it's like, wouldn't it be great if you, when you enter photo mode, that you can have this sort of quality? Uh, the number of polys here, this is not Nanite. This is just regular old rendering technology, but you can see that we have... Uh, high poly characters here and that seems to run fine in Unreal so not not too worried about that and we're going to be starting in on the frame stuff but we've also been doing a art makeover uh, not just art also kind of dialing in the lore of the Tzihu and that's what the stream is about today we're going to give you a sneak peek, peek of some of the art uh, like I said we have been working on extensive uh, art redos here's obviously this is our final female character the culmination of three versions of uh, character models that we've done. So uh, we've been iterating similarly on the Tzihu, and so I'm going to show you that uh, right now. Uh, without further ado, here is a sneak peek of the Tzihu, and I'm going to get my avatar off the screen here and let you guys see this. So hopefully this goes well. All right. I won't talk. I'll just let the movie play, and then as it plays, I'll talk about it. You guys ready for the Tzihu unveil? Uh, un un <laughs> the Tzihu reveal, not the unveil. That was, a, that was an unveiling and a, re and, a, and a reveal at the same time. I, I keep inventing new words here. All right, here we go. Three, two, one.
And that is the new Tihu. We took the base model, we tweaked it a little bit, and then we added some armor pieces to it. One thing you're going to notice... Yeah, yes, it's, these are very unrealistic body standards. In fact, it's, it's very dangerous to your health if you would try to achieve this body standard. So, you know, it's just like games have to warn you about unrealistic body standards in female characters, uh, our trigger warning is don't, don't try to be at Zihu. That's, that's just going to lead you to poor health. And low self-esteem. All right, so uh, one thing you should notice about the Sihu is that, well, let me put my VTuber back. One thing you'll notice about uh, the Sihu is they're a lot less robotic than they were. Do you remember if in the original build, now we did take the textures off and everything, and there's no textures on this because I'm holding off on the final color palette of the game until we have all the models in. I kind of want to see everything together with the terrain and then I want to start doing it. But they are less robotic. They are uh, actually much more kind of tribalistic, much more kind of shamanistic. They have a blend where they take their technology from the crystals of their home world. Huh, where, where have we heard that before? Crystals and crystals, blue, blue crystals, crystalline, crystal. Uh, uh, it's a word that's at the tip of my tongue. I just don't, I just don't know. Um, anyways. <laughs> anyways. Uh, their technology is, is harnessed from um, the, the sort of the, the crystals of their home world. And these things power all of their stuff. And their technology evolved along very different lines from the Gate Strider. Now, why do we do this? Because we wanted to basically enhance the contrast between the gate striders, which are the players, and the enemies that you're fighting, which are the Tsihu, which use giant beasts. It's sort of like, you know, um, early on in Firefall, we talked about how the Chosen should be, you know, uh, more organic, but we never actually pursued that idea. But it's an idea that I came back to after, because, because <laughs> ironically, we, we kind of said to ourselves, oh, that'll never work. We can't have a technological race go up against this sort of like, you know, more fantasy style race. And then Avatar came out, right? <laughs> and everyone's like, wait, that totally works. That totally works. And so we went ahead and, and I said, you know what? I, I want to do that. I want to do that for Ember. It's like I want to get back to the roots of Firefall's uh, core designs, which is a common theme here, right? We're, we're, try, we're, we're re-harvesting all the good ideas we had for Firefall and presenting them in the light of day because you guys never got to see it. And so this is a big part of that. So they, yeah, they don't, you know, they, they don't have guns, right? We got rid of their guns. They had these staves and they, and those are crystals main, that's a crystal main on that fish kaiju skull thing. And that actually fires uh, energy weapons from that staff. And he actually uses that staff as a melee weapon too. And that staff is biotech too. You notice there's an actual kaiju eye in the, in, I don't know, that's not the hilt. What do you call the, the other end of a spear? Not the business end, but the other end. The stock? That sounds gun-like to you. The, the butt of the spear, yes. Does anybody want a close-up of the tail of the spear? Sorry, that's a joke from before. Butt cam. <laughs> oh, by the way, this guy is rendered in Unreal 5. This is, uh, this is all Unreal 5 engine. In fact, he's standing on a piece of nanite terrain. That rock he's standing on is like 8 zillion polygons. So Nanite has its uses. I mean, this isn't slowing anything down. You can, this is all real time. And this is all with the, the Lumen lighting engine. So we, we did the Nanite tests, and I think we're going to do some uh, Lumen tests as well. And then I want to do tests back on tessellating to, to the terrain again. Because if we start blending Nanite meshes selectively with traditional terrain systems, uh, the, the regular terrain is going to look really lo-fi, right? And so we want to see if we can get some tessellation. They don't do actually do tessellation in Unreal 5 anymore. They have a different system. I think it's called, uh, I forget what it's called, Micro Mesh or something. It's, it's some other thing for getting polygons onto your terrain. So this, this, isn't, this isn't photo mode. This is, th these are normal maps. Uh, th this is, uh, uh, well, these are high-res normal maps, obviously. 
So, but, uh, you know, but there's no textures on this guy. This, he's not terracotta, right? He's, he's not like a, a terracotta warrior. He's basically going to be fully textured, fully colored. We just haven't decided on the colors and the look yet of the, of the materials. Because, like I said, I'm holding off until all the reworked art is in the build against our terrain. And I can sort of, like, see it all together. And then we're going to dial in the color palette. Does that make sense? Hey, I'm, I'm liking Unreal 5 a lot, by the way. Not so much the, the Nanite Terrain experiment that, that looked good, but the lighting tools are really awesome. Like, I really like the lighting in the new build, for example. Oh, by the way, uh, some stuff coming up. We have a new CSR skin dropping on the 20th. Do you guys know what that is? Because you guys requested it. Who knows what that is? I was in chat. I was in our Discord server. And I said, what would you like next month from CSR? Does anybody remember? Looks like Warframe. Hmm. Nobody remembers. Okay, good. Then it's going to be a surprise. I think you guys will like it, though. I mean, I hope so. You guys asked for it. <laughs> None of you can remember. Uh, that's right. Shiku te uh, Teshi, Nanite does not work on traditional characters. It only supports um, static meshes, not skinned meshes that deform, like skin and stuff like that. But I think we're getting good results anyways, as you can see from on screen. Okay, so CSR skin dropping on the 20th, and there's also going to be the return of the bunny skin. The bunny skin will be in the general store uh, and it will be a peerless grade skin. So we'll probably have some ear var variants or some bow tie variants, things like this, little, little mesh things. So that will be a limited time sale that will only be up for a couple weeks. And we're doing something new with the subscription program. As you know, the subscription program is grandfathered. It won't be at this price forever. Uh, so it is going to be, uh, after Kickstarter, it will be going up and it's also changing. There's going to be there's going to be tiers to the subscription program afterwards and during launch, uh, which di do different things. But the the skin uh, subscription, which is the one we have now for seven ninety five, that price is locked in. So if you subscribe now, and we're very close to fifteen hundred, which is when we do the heavy frame, by the way, um, and put it into the playable mockup. So thank you for that. But I just want to let you know that uh, we have a new feature coming for the sub subscription program here. Uh, I don't want to promise it just yet because I think it's going to take a little longer than the 20th, but we'll start with the CSR skin on the 20th. And uh, if you would like that skin, of course, please become a monthly patron. You will get the peerless version of that skin. And the bunny will be coming to the general store fairly soon here. All right, so I think that's the, the, you know, the usual stuff out of the way. Uh, one thing I want to talk about is how uh, is, is about the work that Harry's been doing on the Tihu. So we're going to try something new. We are going to have Harry's stream piped through Discord into Twitch. Now, what that means is I'm going to have to leave Cheap Chat. We're all going to have to leave Cheap Chat. We're going to instead be on stream for this part of it. So I do want to do a raffle before we do that. But uh, in order to hear Harry and me and everybody else, until we have a better solution set up, which Harry already has figured out, but we weren't able to get ready in time uh, in for today. Uh, he's going to be going over some of the work we've been doing to the uh, animation system for the Tihu. And you're going to see more art. You're going to see, for the first time, the new Tihu animations. Yes, because Mason's mocap, as good as it was, he's, his legs aren't broken in the way that the Tihu are. So we had to sort of modify that. Plus, we wanted to get a little more, little more personality in there that's not... Uh, capturable by mocap. I think we're going to save mocap for the emotes, the, the gate strider emotes and things like that, more humanistic stuff. But I'm starting to dig some of the, the hand animation that we're doing here. We've got a great animator on the team. And uh, you're going to be seeing more of that. Uh, the bunny is going to be animated on the next one, for example. And it's not going to be like last time I animated the bunny, I used like I bought mocap off a store for a dance an emote and it didn't work out very well. So uh, this time I have. <clears throat> hand animation coming for the bunny. Okay, so uh, bear with me. We're going to try to uh, get this as seamless as possible. 
We, uh, uh, after this raffle, uh, stick around. We're going to show you, uh, Harry's going to show you some of the technology he's been working on. So let's go ahead, and since we're talking about skins, let's do a ketchup pack raffle for those of you here. Ronan, why don't you explain what that is, and let's, let's get going. All right. For those who don't know, we have something called the Ember Patron, and that is a plan where you can put in just a little bit of money every month uh, to Ember to support the progress, the process, and, of course, the playability of the game. Now, when you do that, you, every month you get a new skin. You get a skin for all kinds of different things. It could be for a gun, could be for a mech, could be a pet, a mount, could be a husbando, and, of course, the most popular, a waifu skin. There are a variety of them, and at this point, we have quite a few. So what we're about to do is a raffle for a ketchup pack. A ketchup pack, of course, catches you up with all the skins that you may have missed up to now. And you will get all of the ones available except for the most recent. So in matter of fact, Faye, I bet you have an image of all the skins that you can share with the folks here. I bet you I do too. And there it is. There it is. Yes, those wonderful, wonderful skins. Now, to do a raffle, uh, there's a specific process to it. It's quite simple, but we're going to run a test just to make sure everybody knows how it works. What's going to happen is you're going to see a little sentence from Faye, our community coordinator. Underneath that, you'll see a sentence from the Ember bot. And underneath that, you'll see an emoji. It's a notepad with a pencil on it. You're going to click on that. It will put you in the running. Don't click it twice. It will take you out. Unless you click it again and it, it, three times. You, you get what I'm saying. Uh, you'll know that you're in because it will turn blue. The little the little emoji will turn blue. So that tells you that you're in. And uh, you wait about 30 seconds and find out if you're lucky. So we're going to run a test raffle to make sure that you know how to do it. Guys, if you're over in Twitch right now, you have to come over here into Discord. Because that is where it's happening. We can't raffle on Twitch, so you got to be in Discord. So if you haven't joined yet, hurry up. Let's go. <laughs> If you're listening, click on Chief Chat. Chief Chat. Yes. <laughs> All right, there it is. Okay, Faye, let's run that test raffle. Okay, is everybody ready? Get your mouse clicks ready. On your mark. Get set. Click. And folks, remember not to post anything while the raffle is going. We don't want it to get scrolled away in all the chat. Now remember, this is a test raffle. What you get for this raffle is Faye's thanks, which is, of course, priceless. Atreon, congratulations. All right, Atreon, you get face. Thanks. <laughs> now, hopefully by now, everybody gets the flow, sees how this works. We're about to do the, the one for the ketchup pack. Face thanks is the only raffle that I that I jump in for. Okay, that's, that's the only one I'm trying to get. I don't know about the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> and now, of course, the actual skins. Now, every time we do this, there's at least a few people out there just waiting for these skins. So let's hope somebody who deserves it gets the most lucky. Faye, when you're ready, let's go. All right, everybody get your mouse click ready. On your mark. Get set. Click. Shelly, double rubbing might be might be unfair. I don't know about that. Might be too much good luck. <laughs> I 
Only click on the pencil emoji, otherwise you're getting trolled. And remember, do not post when this is up. <laughs> swoosh congratulations you win a ketchup pack now swoosh what you're gonna do you're gonna send me a private message right now you're gonna say hey there ronan i won a ketchup pack and you're gonna give me your ember id that you use on myember.com all right grums that's the ketchup pack back to you all right congratulations for winning that ketchup pack who won by the way swoosh Swoosh. <laughs> Swoosh. Are, are these your first skins? Speak up, boy. Let me hear you. Or ma'am. Swoosh is more of a sound effect. Maybe a verb? <laughs> All right, I'm back. It's made grums. All right, I don't, I don't hear from Swoosh. So, did Swoosh DM you? Is, he, is, is Swoosh collecting their ketchup pack? Yes, first skins, they say. Oh, first skins. Awesome. Congratulations. Yeah, we do a lot of skins. It, cosmetics are, are really what drives Ember's uh, business model. That's, that's what we do. We don't do gotchas. We don't do anything like that. You, 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 but we do skins and a lot of them. All right. So... Where is the webcam? I am the webcam. All right, so we're going to try to get set up here for Harry's stream. That means Chief Chat will be closing for now. We will come back to this after uh, Harry has done his presentation. And we will do another raffle. And I think, I think we're going to do an Archon pack. Ooh. Is, is, do I have the name right? We have so many packs, I forgot the name. What's what's the five hundred dollar pack? Oh, was that Shifter? Archon? Okay, Shifter. Yeah. thank you, you guys. <laughs> Jeez, I'm gonna get these right. All right, Shifter pack is what we're doing after this uh, this presentation, and so bear with me while we get this set up here. We're gonna close Chief Chat now. You will be able to hear us on stream, so definitely keep. Um, Keep us open on Twitch. You want to head over to Twitch right now. Everybody over to Twitch. All you, all you guys, all you guys and gals, head on over to Twitch because you won't be able to hear us otherwise. Do okay? it now. Do it now. Are you ready? Shoot the glass. No, that's Hans Gruber. That's different. Different Austrian accent. Or German, I don't know. Are they the same? Are Austrian and German? Actors Alan Rickman the same? is English. He's he, what? Well, no, but in the film, he's doing an. Accent. Well, yeah, in in the, in the uh, yeah, he's German, supposedly. Okay, he's German. Is there a difference between a German and an Austrian accent? Uh, there's a lot of differences between individual German accents. They have a lot of stratification. Like the southern ones Austrian. are different from the. All right. Well, that's enough movie trivia for today. Let's all right. Closing chief chat and heading on over. Hopefully on Twitch you won't hear a uh, a discontinuity. But let's see. All right. Okay, we are starting up a different uh, audio stream here. Take my check. This is sentence A. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. All right, I can hear Harry. Can you guys hear Harry? Yeah, all right. I'm just checking Twitch audio here. All right, is is he is he as loud as I am? This is sentence A. I I suppose it should be comparable. Now, I'm going to let you do all the talking, Harry. Uh, uh, but but just in case, okay. uh, you know, just in case I laugh or something or or have an amusing joke to tell to interrupt your presentation. I don't want to be too loud. All right. Well, thankfully, I have these little tweaking knobs of, of the mic processor so I can, you know, tweak the volume. It would be really annoying without it. All right. Okay. They, we... they say you're louder now. Let's go ahead and try the video stream and let's get that going. Okay. Um, uh, clickety click. 
There we go. Okay. Am I streaming the correct one? Yes, I am. Let's Aha. see how it looks. Ah, there we go. You're live. Uh, okay, take it away, Harry. Yeah, there is a... All right. So what we've been working on, what we're trying to get done is what sometimes is referred to as procedural animation. Uh, what we're trying to do is you take all the different animations that, uh, you know, like running animation and dodging animation, and you sort of wrap them up together in a, in a, in a sort of like logical uh, whole, right? So the output of it looks something like this, uh, which is a state machine. That That's at, at some point, at, it, the, the state machine is the core of the animation blueprint as it expressed in Unreal Engine. So these states are mostly self uh, describing so you have like an idle state right you have a running state you have a trot state you have a walking state right and in these individual states different animation is played right so um it's currently in the idle state so now if if i turn him into aggro state he does this thing he's this he does this little screamy shouty thing actually hang on let me turn off the uh, the Z bones because you know it's it's uh... so and if if he goes back to idle then then he sort of just does this we it, it's a question of also transitions uh, of how you transition between the individual states right and that's that's basically what you're doing and what Unreal so what we, what, what we're trying to do is create a believable um reasonably organic system of motion so that they don't do these weird gamified things like moonwalking that, that that that's how it how these imperfections mostly present themselves is moonwalking if you go back to something like deus ex like back to 2001 or whatever that was released you very often see the enemies when they are strafing, they're straight up moonwalking, right? Like the gait, their actual movement of the feet has is not correlated to their movement at all, right? So back then you didn't really care. These days with how AAA gaming sort of has the resources to fine tune all the extreme situations and making real fluid and really organic, uh, the bar is sort of raised. You notice it more, right? Back in those sex, you, you, you didn't care. But now uh, you care. You, you were trained over time to care more about these things because you were shown what is possible or not simply by throwing lots of manpower on it by AAA companies. So that's the sort of the dilemma indie game developers deal with. You sort of have to at least approach it or just select such a genre that doesn't require this kind of work, like 2D pixel platforming or so, right? So one of the, so you can have this easy uh, sort of like, let's, let's look at uh, running, right? Uh, so you had, you, and, and you can see this. So this, this was, this was uh, like one of these errors. Uh, if, if you, if you pay close attention to him, uh, let me actually go back. Let's go back, switch him back to idle. That's a neat animation. Uh, I'm, I'm going to slow it down now and make him run, right? So you can see a little bit of shimmer in his legs. And then this, 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 is th this thing is going to happen where... Uh, see, he slowed down. There's, there's this like hitch in between the transitions. And... That's one of those very detailed, very extreme situations that nevertheless you have to fix and control for. And the more organic, the more flawless you want it to feel, the more... more complicated it gets, right? So you do, uh, to, to, to give you an idea how to fix something like that, what you basically have to do is match up the point in time of this looping running animations, which is, 
this animation right here. So, so this this is one animation, right? This this, this is like in the building block. This is an animation. Um, uh, and then you have something like the transition, right? So when you have idle to run, you have this little animation, which is a different animation, which you can see if if I if I if I scrub through it, you can see that he's standing still, and then he does this little launch, right? It, which is different from his actual running loop, right? So that's why it's two separate things. And what you are trying to do is synchronize this animation and the running loop so that you don't get the slowdown between it, right? So that it feels, it, it flows into one another seamlessly. And what you have to do basically is find the point in time in this looping animation uh, to hand it over from the previous animation. And this is done through something called distance matching, wherein you basically create a information, a meta information on the animation uh, with where the positions of the feet are. Right or for example, this is usually how it's done. You, you you either take the root or the feet, right? And then what you're trying to do is find a point in time in this looping animation or the animation you're transitioning to, and play it from that point onward. And you you, you can you can hear it, it's 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 like really detailed sort of not almost pointless level of details, but that kind of detail is required to create a really fluid sort of locomotion uh, system. And what we call locomotion is the whole uh, package of standing, running, sliding, strafing, all the thing. This is generally called locomotion, right? Uh, another thing is, uh, the, and that, that is the primary thing that we have been messing with, or I have been messing with, is that what to do, how to match the speeds Right, because these animations, like when you look at the, the this sort of looping animation, right? Um, uh, it it is it is animated to emulate a certain specific speed, right? So I think this is fourteen meters per second. So this is this is this is like a fixed speed at which the animator created it, right? This this is arbitrary, but from the position of the animator. So so the guy who's doing, uh, who's actually you know setting up this animation on on where the leg's supposed to be is targeting a certain speed, right? So this is this this is roughly 14 meters per second, right? And what you have to do is either make sure you're all the, the the actual character in game is always running at that speed and no other speed, which is really constraining. Or you tweak it. You sort of do this procedural adjustment, which is called uh, Speed warping, or as Unreal Engine, or Unreal guys call it in Unreal Engine Five, stride warping, which is which is this little helpful node, which is new in Unreal Engine Five, and what that basically is trying to do, and I have to turn on the uh, turn on the bones for this. Um, let's. Uh, what, what this is trying to do is so so this is where the bones are supposed to be, right? There's one more step behind this, which is matching the actual feet to, to, to this virtual sort of bone that's flying around. This is called the IK bone, which is like, uh, this is where I want the, the, the feet foot to be. And that's not how usually you do things. Usually you just have, the way bone hierarchy works is you have different rotations uh, from the parent to the child, right? So it goes from, top to bottom. Inverse kinematics is exactly that inverse. You just you just point where you want the bone to be and you have to go back up the chain and figure out what the rotations are. Uh, and basically what, what this node, this stride warping node is doing is calculating a position. See that the, there's this little, uh, there's imperfection in there, right? If, if you see it, it's not matching perfectly and it sort of crashes through, through it. These are like those details that have to be sort of ironed out, right? And what this is trying to do is, is reduce the gate, procedurally change the gate without you actually modifying the animation and going back to the dude. You, you, you basically don't ask the animator to create a different animations for, I don't know, every one meter per second step, right? You do this sort of procedural modification of it. You shorten the stride. Uh, to adjust it to the actual speed that he's running at. So if you want to slow, you, if you want to slow him down, like for example, you, he has a debuff, 
he, for some reason, his speed has been reduced by an insignificant amount, let's say 10%. And uh, at that point, you would start seeing him moonwalking, right? And you don't want that. You, again, it, 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 you, it can be forgiven, but the, again, the standards of, of the general industry are ever higher, and you sort of you 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 don't want this. It, it's basically seen as lazy if you don't if you if you don't address these these moonwalking sort of uh, suspensions of disbelief. And uh, the, basically, well, what's, uh, what we're trying to do here, or what this note is doing uh, after extensive configuration and, and and fiddling with it, because there's there's a lot of options in here that goes into it, right? So this is the options panel over here. There's a lot of config, the, the tweaking not. And um, you're trying to reduce the, the stride, right? So what happens now if I hook up the inverse kinematics variant, we actually try to uh, match the IK bones to the feet, so we actually change the feet. Uh, let's see how that works, right? See, uh, he's, he's uh, Charlie Chaplining a little bit. His, his stride has been reduced. Like this is, this is by 50%. You, ideally, you wouldn't reduce it by up to 50% because you're, gonna, you're, you're getting comical results, right? So like here, you, you, you're going to see his bones sort of crashing. Yeah, the, the, this, this weird, uh, you, you don't want to go that extreme, right? Ideally, you would go to something like 70%. Just reducing it by 70% should be, yeah, that's just about enough, right? His, his stride. Oh uh, yeah, there's still wacky things happening, but that's a problem of in setting up the inverse kinematic, which I get to in a bit. Um, but his stride has been reduced, right? So now he's prone to moonwalk uh, to a lesser extent, and on 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 a higher uh, on 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 a larger sort of uh, more higher level, right? When his speed drops more, what you what you can do is simply have these different gates. Either we currently have the run, then we have the trot, which is this, which is slightly slower, and you, you can uh, also see his, his uh, whacking stick is in a different place, right? So in, in this particular animation, he holds it forward, right? Uh, and then you have walk, which is even slower, which he's just, you know, casually walking around. These are all uh, pegged to different speeds, right? And you, in the, you, you, you have to apply uh, the stride warping to each of them individually, but you have to transition between the, the different, these, these are three different states that I showed up here, right? And you still have to transition between them, ideally seamlessly, simply by uh, how fast he is moving in the world. And this is something you, you receive from the some, this game logic. So, so the game logic sort of calculates how fast he is moving with, with the acceleration and all that, all that stuff, that, that, that's your usual game logic -y thing right just 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 movement calculation just basic physics right and then then you sort of try to uh, work around it uh, create such an animation result that uh, accurately reflects the movement speed right and try tries to match the gate on top of that on top of that movement speed right and uh yeah that that's basically the the, the name of the game uh, what we will still the next step the next part of the locomotion package, as it's this is a sort of like standardized uh, feature that or, or standard part that you usually include is turning in place. That that's kind of important, and also strafing. Uh, those are like the big sort of logical parts of the locomotion system. This, this, this is like one major part, just 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 the different strides and different speeds. Um, and then we will tackle the other ones, but the. Uh, Mostly when you have one figure out, the other sort of fall in place because uh, the most difficult part of it is just, just learning how all this stuff works and then being able to model this in your mind. Uh, so, so considering the last thing, which is the inverse kinematics, which is uh, the IK solver, which is also something new in Unreal Engine 5, they added this full body IK thing. This is what is called a control rig. This is a mechanism, a system that is sort of designed to do these sort of inverse kinematic things, as far as I understand it, it's more data-driven. Uh, the, these animation blueprints are almost entirely uh, procedurally driven. And what I mean by that is, at no point in the flow of this code, right, can you get p uh, precise position of these bones, right? So I cannot, from here, pull on, uh, c like, calculate a position of this bone, because that's not, not, not how animation blueprint works. It's just sort of a series of instructions that you, you can work with data that is external, like the movement speed of the character that you, that you pass through, 
the blueprint or or some constants, but you don't know the position of the bones when you are trying to set up the animation, right? Uh, this is this control rig. It seems is 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 meant to sort of uh, uh, supplant. To supplement that where you, you here you can actually get the position of a specific bone right so here to set up the inverse kinematics i take the position of the ik foot which is again the bone that i point to and say uh yeah yeah, yeah match match the actual foot uh, match the actual foot with this 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 little bone thing here and there's a lot of settings here relating to constraints like as in like you see like you saw in here in this little uh, where should we go? Uh, run, yes, it's run. So when when we go to zero point five stride, uh, you can see that there's the, 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 this funky stuff that's happening here, where when he's, he's breaking the bones. All of this can be addressed through through this this, this IK. Uh, this IK node where you set up the limitations, the stiffness of the bones, uh, how far the bones can bend, because by default, and if if the constraints are not not set up in in the skeleton, I think. Uh, the inverse kinematic system doesn't know that the bones don't bend that way, or nor do they have any idea of where should they really bend, like which direction is preferable, right? It doesn't know that bend, meaning knees don't bend, don't bend backwards. It's it's something you have to uh, set up, and so yeah, this 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 is a helpful little feature um, added in Unreal Engine five again. The previously they had something they had they actually like purchased. Uh, a company called Power IK is one of their acquisitions, and they use it in Unreal Engine four. And and for some reason, in Unreal Engine five, it's not present. They, they sort of it, either it was rolled into this, which, which is likely the scenario, because I think when I was working on Unreal Engine four, there was a very similar note to this that was the actual Power IK note. So I think they just rolled uh, the Power IK uh, stuff into this. And yeah, that that's that that's you 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 can do other things with with control rig. That I'm, you don't don't quite have the handle on, but this this is the primary use case for this, I think, because you you can also have, uh, like these, uh, you know, controls. You can have these actual sort of like arbitrary positions in the world, which is not something you can really simply do in the animation blueprint, where you're dealing mostly with states and the sort of procedural, uh, taxonomical orientation of it or whatever. Um, so. Yeah, this little hon honky funky thing that has to be fixed, and uh, yeah, that, that's that's what I'm working on now. It's not really my area expertise, but then again, nothing is. Uh, so yeah, uh, hopefully I can get that done soon, and then we can push this out and have them be realistically organic, realistically organic enemies running around, shooting at you, and uh, not do weird moonwalking stuff. So, and, uh, Harry, we got a couple of questions if you have some time. Oh, yes, go ahead. Uh, people are asking yes. if, if this will handle slopes. Yes, uh, part of it, um, part of the IK is, well, maybe there's an additional step, but slopes is something that, that's being handled by the IK system. Uh, as for the stride itself, it doesn't really, well, well, well what it does take is this specific uh, rotation. In which direction you want to you want this to reduce the stride, the, and you also have this uh, floor input floor normal, which means well, you you pass in normal, which is the perpendicular vector of the thing you are standing at. So when you're standing on a flat floor, that it's pointing upwards. If you're standing on a 54 or 45 degree incline, it's pointing, you know, at a 45 degree angle away from the slope. Uh, so I think this, this this stride warping node is quite versatile and deals with it. It even has like the, the uh, gravity direction uh, that you can set up to it, which is by default, you know, straight down. But in, if, if you have some fancy wall running stuff, then I suppose you, you could incorporate it in this. So, the, so this node that they set up here is really, really nifty for all that. And uh, as for the slope, not actually the, the, the feet, properly standing on a slope. I think the full body IK, uh, this thing, handles that. I think the... Um, I think the... Because what, what happens when you when you are accounting for slopes, you have to do line traces. You have to actually detect where, um, where the specific positions 
because what, what can happen is that the IK bone it can protrude below the ground, below the slope. So what you effectively do is reproject uh, the IK bone onto the slope. And you can easily do that by just, you know, uh, casting a ray cast or line trace from uh, really high up down to the bone and, you know, changing the IK bone's location to the point where it collides, right? So that is how you would work around that. But I think this does that. And if not, then, it, then it's fairly simple. Hey, can this do line traces? Uh, this is debug. And also, I suppose you have to do this to sort of uh, feed that position here if, if, if you wanted to do that, if, if it doesn't actually do that. But I have a feeling it, it, it actually handles the slope thing. Yeah, so, so that's another, the best uh, I can. I have, yeah. Another question is, uh, you know, is this being calculated frame by frame? Yes, I guess this, the, you can't, yeah. You can avoid uh, basically, um, yeah. This this has to be done frame by frame because uh, if if you were to skip some frames, you simply would have outdated calculations, and all these positional data are really sensitive to change, right? So the moment it's not like perfectly calculated for that state of the world it's the, the uh, enemy or, or the, the character finds itself in it's going to be uh, looking off uh, the benefit is that it all works on the client server doesn't care about this server doesn't care if all the enemies are moonwalking right the, for, the, as far as server is concerned the animations can be completely disabled and uh, well uh, unless you are doing like hit calculations but Aside from that, you, you you can turn the animations on temporarily to do the hit verification stuff, but the server doesn't need the animations to run. It's purely cosmetic, right? Uh, so and what you can do is do this sort of, sort of like level of detail system, wherein this level, this detailed level of calculation only happens to characters that are reasonably close to you. And things that are... You, you, you can see this in some games. In fact, most of the games do it. If you, uh, well, what's the example of this? Something like, I think, Planetside. I'm fairly sure Planetside does this. If you ever saw a soldier running out far away in the distance, it seems like you're watching a 15 FPS cartoon from the 80s. And that's what they're doing. This is the LOD sort of nature of the animation system that they employ. That the uh, characters that are far away don't even necessarily calculate on every frame and have a very simplified calculation. And it looks very, very goofy. It's very noticeable, but it, in, in planet side, you have like 200 people on the screen, so you have to do it, but yeah. I think uh, one thing that uh, is prompting questions like, hey, is this calculated every frame? Does it handle slopes? Is, you know, maybe people are wondering what part's procedural and what part's animation driven? Right, so, Specifically, the stride warping, this thing is procedural. The, you're basically going into this animation, which is static. The, the best you can change is play rate and where you started from, whether it's looped. And that's about all that you can modify on the static animation. Rest of it uh, is what we can describe as procedural. Uh, if you change, you, you can change, you can, you can shift, you can translate the individual, individual bones up and down, right? Uh, but again, everything, all, all the data that basically leaves this node is, is, is procedural. Everything that's stemming from, this is source of the sort of static animation data, right? That, that the animation in, in the Maya or whatever tool you use is, is created. And yeah, so... That, that's how I understand it. So basically what we're doing here is we're taking a base animation, right? But we yeah. want to eliminate things, a couple things. The, the two things that we've been working on right now, Harry's been working on, is elimination of the sort of like uh, awkward blend between different static animations, specifically starts and stops, uh, and picking sort of like the right the right moment to do that blend between them. That's one thing. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's the thing that I described at the beginning, which is figuring the time at which point in time of the static animation, you should start playing the animation so that it matches up with the previous animation perfectly in terms of positions of the legs and then the visual bones and stuff like that. The other thing it, that the system 
is doing is Harry is dynamically adjusting the stride or the gait of the character, how far they move their feet forward from the static animation. The static animation is fixed, right? And you see this in games all the time. You see characters sliding around the terrain. And as Harry mentioned, that's that's not considered acceptable uh, anymore, right? Like before that was an accepted part of you know, gaming for many years because there wasn't enough technology to do this. But now, uh, oh, Giga just made a pun. He called it the Gate Striders, spelling it G-A-I-T. Thanks, Giga. Uh, but now what we're doing is we are adjusting the legs, the position of the legs, so that as the creature runs faster or slower or speeds up and slows down, the sliding is greatly minimized, if not eliminated. And so you can actually have characters accelerate now and decelerate, and the feet should, for the most part, look a lot better than what would happen in the old days where the, the legs would just move. And if you actually play, remember playing our old demos with the T who in it, their legs would move really fast, but they'd be sliding over the terrain, and it just looks kind of comical. Hard to be intimidated by the T who when they're doing Charlie Chaplin-like moves on the terrain. So uh, the other thing this is, um, is a benefit for designers because we're still experimenting with the run speeds and the walk speeds of the Tihu. <clears throat> and by the way, they have, a, they have a walk and they have a trot and they have an all-out run animation. And the system is designed to blend between those and pick the right animation base for the speed and then adjust the feet. And so we should have very fluid-looking Tihu uh, as they as they attack you. So the other thing is, as designers, we can sit here and we can modify the run speeds and the walk speeds, and we don't we don't mess up the animation, right? Like we don't have to go back to the before. If we change the run or the walk speed to suit the gameplay, we would have to go back to the animator and say, "Hey, here's the new run speed. Can you redo your whole animation?" And we don't we don't want that, right? That's a lot of like rework. But for design, you want the flexibility to make changes and to tweak run speeds without having to break everything. So that's the other important thing. Uh, the other thing that Harry mentioned is turn in place. Uh, doing a character standing still and rotating to face you is actually not as simple as you would think. So there's actually different uh, approaches to that, uh, different things that Harry will be looking at. And depending on the creature, it also varies. Right now, the thumper turn in place looks very goofy uh, because he sort of like turns his whole body awkwardly when he does so. But if you were to apply that same solution for him versus someone else, it would look okay on another uh, smaller character, but not okay for something that's supposed to be big and gigantic. Another interesting thing about Unreal 5 is that the IK solver um, handles more than two legs. Now, this is very important for Kaiju, obviously. So uh, a benefit of porting our stuff to Unreal 5 is we get to take advantage of all these new nodes and animation tools that are either not present in Unreal 4 or only uh, present in sort of proto form. Like they bought that. Harry was talking about how they bought that IK solver to integrate. with um, Unreal in 4, and you can use it in 4, and you can use a form of control rig in, in 4 as well. But in 5, the IK system is much more powerful. In the Unreal demo, Valley of the Ancients for Unreal 5, they actually show how a character can vault over a stone plinth, basically. And before, the way that games would do it is if you wanted a character to vault over a stone, a low stone wall or plinth or anything like that, the animator would have to know how high that plinth is and hand animate it to, to for just that height. And if you ever change the height of that wall, the animation wouldn't work. Well, with procedural animation in Unreal 5 using their IK system and the control rig, uh, designers can vary the height of that wall, obviously within reasonable limits. And the character animation will just adjust it when they, like, they, you know how they plant their hand on the wall and they vault over in the demo? That height is procedurally calculated. So that's another benefit of Unreal 5. And I Actually, that is something oh, that, that we are going to be using specifically for, uh, I suppose you can, uh, because what that is, it's not necessarily part of the 
what it's called, it's motion warping, and it's part of the animation montage, right? It's basically the uh, system to uh, a system to have the animation montage to give the animation montage positional direction, where to land, where to plan the film, uh, when to uh, plan the yeah, like like you said, right? Uh, but what specifically what we will use it for is uh, these things, right? These dodges. Uh, so th this is animation that that we're sort of planning to use for them to get behind cover, right? And obviously, it, it is not the case that they will always be in the perfect distance, right? The cover will not always be here, right? Sometimes the cover is going to be here. And that is where the motion warping comes in. We basically feed the position of the cover uh, to, to this montage and it moves it properly uh, behind the cover. That is, that is determined through EQS or, or some other system. And yeah, that we, we're going to be using that for this. And, and this animation montage is, uh, yeah. Uh, hang on, let me actually do the bone, go away bone. There we go. So yeah. Uh, the end. The, the motion warping isn't that sophisticated. It's just it just uses some very simple translational lerps, but it, it should work enough. Basically, uh, it, it, I, I'm wondering if if the, but that that's something we're going to have to experiment with. If if the distance is too short, it might look comical. Wherein he goes through all all of the, all, all of this, and he only ends up like one meter next to him. So. So he does this, 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 all this, only to real this whole animation only to end up like one meter away from him. That is going to look comical, probably. I'm not sure how the anim the, the the motion warping deals with it. Um, I think motion warping it's it's somewhere added in here. I think it's like a notify or. Uh, motion. No, uh, I haven't looked into it, but but if it's somewhere in here, I will watch it. I watch the. Ah, uh, there we go. Motion warping. So you basically set up this thing. You tell it to. Uh, well, what you what you're basically setting is the root, right? Well, you you're defining where the root should be, and the root is incidentally. Uh, this the, the this thing 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 magic here, right? Uh. Yeah, this this is what it's called. I'm not sure if this this animation is actually enabled. This is called root motion, wherein you actually move this root in 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 uh, in the world, right? That's not usually what the animation does. Usually, the root stays in place, and the animation just sort of plays on top of it, and you don't mess with the actual position of the character. This root motion actually moves the character in the world, and it's basically the inversion of how the data normally flows. Usually, the game blueprints and uh, have do all the game logic calculation to uh, to determine where the character is in the world, right? So, so speed, acceleration, direction, th that kind of thing. Uh, and then you feed it basically to this animation blueprint, and it plays the the, the monkey things to to in in representation to to fit the state of, of the, the calculated state, right? Uh, so it goes from game blueprint to animation blueprint. This is inversion. This is basically the animation telling the game blueprint, I'm going to move here. I'm, I'm going to move the entire aperture, the entire character uh, that way. So yeah, in, in, in this case, it's moving uh, like, uh, what's it like? Yeah, you can, you can see up here, it's moving roughly 500 units, uh, 520 units to the right uh, from its initial position. And you have to reflect that in the game because, well, what, what if you don't do that? What could happen is that uh, at at the end of the day, this animation thing, this this, it, it's only a cosmetic, it's only a visual representation. It's not what 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 the actual game works with, what the game logic works with, right? If you were not to synchronize the two, uh, his hitbox would still be here at the beginning, and you would try to shoot him, the thing that you actually see. But you wouldn't hit him because his capsule is still here. But uh, you didn't actually move him. You just sort of played the animation. The animation sort of became desynchronized from the 
the collision volumes and the logical representation of it, and it's it sort of the, the thing breaks down, right? So you, you you're still in the you you're always in this act trying to synchronize the visual and the logical, and yeah. So this motion warping, this is also a new feature of Unreal Engine Five. They they they're using it in the demo, like 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 Mark said, and uh, uh, there's some. Uh, you, you basically set the relevant position for this. Uh, yeah, you see, you see simple warp basically. You set up a sync point. This is just the text, and you set the position of this sync point in the game logic. And yeah, you basically play around with this. Harry, so we got that, another question. Up, oh, bring uh, on. People are asking uh, how much of this can be shared with other characters. Um, you know, basically, I guess that, that that's a broad question encompassing, I think, yes, both the animations I, as well as the animation state machines. Yes, I was concerned about that as well. So the the immediate answer is to all characters that share the same skeleton, because all this anima, all all the animations, all the animation blueprints, all all all, all these non uh, things that you see in here are tied to the skeleton, which is uh, this thing here, right? If 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 your thing has the skeleton, no problem. If you change the skeleton, you can do some retargeting things, but I'm not sure how the animation blueprint, if 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 the animation blueprint solution that you have, if it really translates well. And at the end of the day, you can have it really, really generic, but at some point you will arrive at uh, particulates. So uh, at particular adjustments like tiny adjustments of moving this bone up because i don't know if so if i were to apply this change the skeleton to have four fingers or five fingers instead of three right uh if i do some particularly uh sensitive finger work like for example if i'm trying to grip a gun and i'm trying to do inverse kinematics on gripping the gun then when I increase the number of thumbs, you're in a different situation, right? And it doesn't, I have to do it differently. There's no, no way around it, right? Um, so you don't have that much flexibility. Even if you make it really, really generic and it's easy to copy and paste, you have to copy and paste it at the end of the day. You duplicate in the code, and which, which is something no programmer likes doing. Because the moment you duplicate code, you whenever you change something in one, you have to do this exact same change in the second one. Or if you duplicate in more times, that you when you have three different copies of the of the code and you make some changes, you, you, it's getting really unfortunate. You, yeah, yeah. Uh, you you can standardize some of it. You can stand like for example, if you, if I were to create a, a, these these kind of nodes, right? You, these can be shared between all of them, right? This is portable. Uh, the states like this thing. I'm not sure if I can control C, control V into a different animation blueprint of a different skeleton. I don't know how that would work. And even if I would do that, at that moment, you have two different state machines. And if, if I were to change, you know, lines, if I were to, you know, create different lines, create, adjust the transitions, you have to simply do the same change in, in, the, in the other copy. And that increases the work. So I'm, I'm I, again, I'm, I'm not good at this. I'm was doing it. For, maybe there is a way. I know there are stuff like uh, sync group names, like this, 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 these, these transition things have like transition rule shared things. I, I don't know. Some of this might be shared. I'm not sure if this is even shareable between skeletons, between animation blueprints. Maybe this is only for a blueprint. I haven't studied the portability of these things at all. So uh, again, there, there's there's um, uh, how should I say? Uh, I didn't study this. This is what I'm saying. I'm I'm, I'm learning it as I go, and it, it is possible that that most of what I said is 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 wrong or inaccurate. It's just I'm I'm doing what I can as I move along. So yeah, it's, it's, it, it would it would be good if we had a copy of me, a clone of me that's slightly less existentially, you know, debilitated. That that would be doing these things and and, and knew his stuff, right? Uh, no, it's only one of me, unfortunately. So um. One thing that was another question is if we go back to the run animation, I don't know if he can pull that yes, up. Yes, uh, um, right here. Well, he's currently running, yes. This is running animation. 
Okay, someone was saying that there is a, a tick in the loop. Uh, and they're asking that, that, if that was an artifact of the playback engine in Unreal 5 or if that's something that w w we're still working on. A tick in the loop. Or the, well, I'm not sure what that means. Well, I'm not sure which animation they were looking at the time. It was fairly early on in the presentation. So you, you have these That sort stop of was cool, by the way. Can you do that again? I don't think people have seen uh, that. Sure. So, so the, got... the, maybe this little tick that that's between the, the transitions. Yeah, that's something that's, again, that's where the distinct machine comes in. Here's the stop. Yeah. Yeah, he sort of. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Oh. All right, I suppose what you can do is, is go through all the individual states and the transitions. So this is aggro state. He does this little shouty thing. So let me actually turn off the bones for presentation purposes. Let me expand this to do, do more of the preview. Um, there's walking. This, this, this is not very elegant. Trans I, mean, I don't think we have actually transitions for that. We have some transitions, like explicit. Uh, where we don't have transitions is just a simple blend. And blend is you simply take position A, you take position B, and you create a straight line. You drag the bone across a straight line between the two positions. That's what blend is, right? And uh, the only parameter of that is the time it takes to blend from one to the other. So if, you, if, if when you see that snap, that just means the blend is really, see, like that blend is, is really quick. It's, I think it's stand at 0 0.2 seconds. So, yeah. So this is the aggro stance. Uh, this is the running stance. So, he's, so he launches a little bit, then he transitions into this loop. Then you have trot. Again, this is just a simple blend. He just, just whips out the, the, the stick. He just changed the pose of the stick uh, from having it behind him to, to forward. Then you uh, change into walk. He just, he just slows like, like this. And then there is a uh, play. And he's dead. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, are you able to control the blend speeds? That was another question. What about the speed uh, yes, when it yes, blends? Yes, yes. Dark Dream's asking. Uh, in the, all, these, all these lines, uh, well, the, the lines that terminate in a state, right? So, for example, uh, this have these blend setting, right? And you can change the nature of the blend. It, it can be linear. It, I, I don't know what this is. It's some fancy mathematics stuff. Sinusoidal, something with nose or, or, or sine curves. I, I don't know. I don't understand most of these. Uh, I know what linear is. I maybe know what cubic is. <laughs> I don't know what all of these might mean. And what you basically, that's the nature of the curve. So, so if you're going from point A to B, you, you're basically changing the shape of the line across which the bone is actually dragged. If you, if you know, you're, yeah. And this duration can be individually set for all the transitions. I'm not sure it can, if it can be set programmatically, like dynamically. I, maybe custom something? Yeah, yeah, not sure. You have a custom blend curve. So, but that's static for the most part. You, there is a way to dynamically create curves, but that, that's on voodoo. I, I wouldn't go into that. But, but in terms of like having it be static, yeah, you can change the durations. That's a more of a design work, more of a what I'd like to call, uh, you know, it, it's basically design fine tuning. It's like when you're changing damage values on weapons. It, it, it's that kind of thing. It's 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 a uh, Tweaking the knobs, uh, doing the detailing, the the, the, the detailing pass, right? Uh, what, what what I'm currently doing is just just building the thing. So so at at some point, I guess I would go over these, uh, change these durations so that it looks more natural, so that it it's not snappy, instantly snappy like that. And I'm I'm fairly sure we're still missing some some transitions. So so. Uh, by transitions, I mean an actual animation that plays in between uh, the main state. So when, when, when you have trot as a main state, you have this little transition animation that goes from aggro state to the trot state, right? That's a specific animation uh, that, that, that we played. And you, I, I just have to plug it in like this 
I, I don't know if it's where if, if there is a way to sort of parameterize this to generalize this and i'm not sure even if i wanted to do something like that it's just you have this have, have a single node here that has transition and pr uh, procedurally or programmatically set up uh, uh, which animations belong to which destination state uh, that's now the animation blueprint doesn't really have tools for that maybe you would have to create something custom and i'm not 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 uh, no time for that all right harry thank you very much for the presentation on the animation node system that you've been building using the new features of unreal 5 we will be creating a um like i said the new who unit and their behaviors uh, based off this work that Harry's been doing on, so you guys will get to experience that uh, at some future point. I'd like to get back to Chief Chat now, so we can do our raffle and catch up with everybody and open up voice uh, to Discord again. So I'm going to turn off Harry's stream here, and we're going to hop on over. And again, uh, I want to thank Harry for the tremendous amount of work he's put into this to, to present it to you. Uh, you know, having him on stream is really great. Uh, taking your questions was wonderful. And let's all get back there. Harry will rejoin us in Chief Chat in a moment. Here we go. Switching over. Let's see here. All right, we are going back to Discord. So if you will join us there, I should be back here on Cheap Chat. Can you guys hear me in Cheap Chat? Awesome. Okay, we are back. Uh, again, you know, I keep showing the Neko. It's kind of like our intermission screen. Our, our Feli Gates Strider has become our intermission screen. I hope you guys like it. But I'm going to put the Tihu back up because that's what we've been talking about today. So we have been, uh, we did the art reveal of the Tihu and we talked about Harry's work on the animation system and how we're creating our own custom animation system for the Tihu. Uh, different from the players. The players actually use a commercial system that we've highly customized called ALS, uh, but we need something a little more streamlined, and to, we want to give the Tihu a lot of personality. You know, I can't, you know, you remember I, I would stream Destiny and talk about how I thought they did the, the better job of the two between Destiny and Anthem versus for personality of the enemies. I think that's so important. I think having... NPCs that exude personality in their animations and their behaviors just makes them more fun to fight in an intangible way. It's one of those, you know, it's not really gameplay, but it translates over to some sort of intangible fun quality. Uh, someone asked, is that the skull of a murloc on his staff? And I said, on his staff, and I said, no, no comment. <laughs> No comment. That'd be funny if there was a Murloc Kaiju in the game. <laughs> I can't even do it. That's actually good form, to be honest. It's, you, it's better than I can do it. Yeah, you guys know how whoa, the sound whoa, effect whoa, whoa, whoa. was. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Harry. You know how the sound effect was really done. No uh, idea. Our sound you designer, Tracy, he was, uh, he was in the audio booth, and he was having lunch, and he was making Murloc noises. And he decided, and part of his lunch was yogurt. And he decided to gargle the yogurt to make that sound. <laughs> and it was in beta. And we took it out of beta because it was a placeholder. And the community was in uproar. They're like, bring it back. And so, <laughs> so we brought it back. But that's actually the sound of yogurt being gargled. You know, I, I usually make inappropriate jokes. You guys are making it too easy today. You gotta stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was not that was not an innuendo, by the way. I don't want to get into trouble. That's that was actual. We're talking real yogurt here. <laughs> I'm fairly sure nobody thought of anything different until you brought it up. 
I didn't bring it up. I didn't say. Okay. What did I say? What did I say? <laughs> All right, we did promise you another raffle here um, for being here for our stream. And I think I'd like to do a shifter pack with Ronan and Faye leading the raffling of this $500 value pack for Ember. So please take it away. Ah, uh, yeah, $500 value, a shifter pack. Matter of fact, let's show them the, uh, the graphic for that, Faye, if you've got it on hand. What? I sure do. <laughs> Not moose, yes. Another waffle. <laughs> Boom. Boom. All right. Now, what comes with this here shifter pack? You get a tiki-themed dropship. It's a commemorative dropship variant with a tiki-inspired paint job and mesh adornments. Tacky, only if you hate Firefall. <laughs> you get an Omniframe build name reservation. You see, at Ember, the first time you build an Omniframe with a specific set of gear, you get to name it. And so this is something a shifter can do early. That'll be awesome. You get a max variant of the uh, dropship. Only Archons and Arc Legions get this, so this is awesome. The max dropship comes in orange, purple, and chroma colors. Yes. Bad backer decal. You can use it on vehicles, frames, and as a spray. You get three test builds and three playable mock-ups. You get three final copies of the game when it comes out. You get the Razor Chroma Founder Dropship skin, 3D printed files for the Kaiju model. You get to reserve your character name. You get a form ribbon. That way everybody can be jealous of your Archon, okay? You get the Razor Chroma Founder G-Suit version two player skin, fits on both male and female. You get the Founder Dropship. It's a unique model, comes in a blue and yellow skin. You get the Founder G-Suit version two player skin, this one's different. The first one's chroma. This one's just not chroma. You get carbon fiber. It's a special shader. It goes on your omni frame. That comes for the light, the medium, and the heavy. Okay. You get a form tag. That's right. You get put on the founder's wall when the game comes out, and you get access to the PDF design book to see all the genius that Grums was putting together before he started to make it true with his mighty team of mega devs. Okay. So we're about to give these give this away to somebody who's lucky, to whoever it is that actually gets. Smiled on by Lady Luck. Now, does everybody know how the raffles work? Now, Twisted Void, do you know how to click on an emoji? <laughs> then you will do just fine. <laughs> the emoji looks like that there uh, thing that foe just posted uh, that fate not foe i can use words that, <laughs> that right there okay i am the real fay <laughs> not the faux fay they fight faux fums <laughs> you can't win face thanks quadrana it's already gone it's given away not for you <laughs> all right guys we're gonna do this friggin' raffle for a 500 hundred dollar value shifter pack Faye, take it away. All right, everybody ready? Get this mouse clicks ready. If you're not in Discord, you better hurry up. All right, on your marks, get set, click. Here it is, guys. Here's your shot. That's a big one. And please remember, do not post during the raffle so everybody gets a chance to see it and click it. We don't want it getting lost in the shuffle. Ooh, 92 people. 94 people. 95 people. Who's waiting? Who's waiting until now to hit it? It's like three seconds left. Come on. <laughs> Zombie schnitzel. Congratulations, Zombie Schnitzel. You get a shifter pack. Now, what you're going to do, of course, is you're going to send me a private message right away. You're going to say, hey, Ronan, I want a shifter pack. And you're going to give me your Ember ID that you use on myember.com. Now, guys, this is an epic raffle. It's super cool. I know a lot of you are thinking, but I, I missed it. I didn't get it. Well, that's why you have to show up at every chief chat, because you might get a chance to get something like this. Okay? You don't want to miss it. So make sure to show up every time. How does Schnitzel become a zombie? Well, obviously, it was bitten by a zombie. I mean...
Okay, Grums, back to you. All right. That was an awesome raffle. Thank you so much for running that. And congratulations, zombie schnitzel. As far as uh, how a schnitzel becomes a zombie, I guess, you know, schnitzel starts off as cow, right? So it'd be a zombie cow that got turned into schnitzel. I like that, because then you can make a lot of zombie schnitzel. <laughs> okay, everybody, thank you again for a one, another wonderful stream. I'm going to bring up the Felly Gate Strider again, just because that's she's become sort of our mascot for these streams. Uh, until the bunny. The bunny will be coming up soon. How many of you are interested in the bunny outfit? How many of, how many of you liked it in the, in the monthly patron and are looking forward to seeing... Seeing her animated. I intend to have several of her gathered around, and it will be a true harem. <laughs> the, 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 the bunny harem. <laughs> this is, you know, we, we have to have a bunny outfit because we're, we're drifting into JRPG territory here. Every time I play Final Fantasy, I, 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 I see another costume, and I'm like, huh, we should do that too. <laughs> Uh, I know uh, Ezreal, sometimes the style, isn't going to drive with some people, and that's why we can mute skins. So if you don't like the look of something, it doesn't fit the world archetype for you, you can mute the skin and they will go back to their default uh, Gate Strider outfit. Yeah, I, I would have to say Final Fantasy XIV is a huge source of inspiration. Every time I go to uh, Limsa Lominsa, I'm like looking at, uh, all the, pe the people and how they're dressed up. And when I'm in the open world, I'm always checking out people's mounts. They just have tons of cool stuff. And uh, it's, 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 they just have fun with it, you know? And the fishing is good too. Not, not great. I gotta say, fishing is good, but not great. Fishing in Ember will be great. All right. <laughs> all right, everybody. Thank you very much for another excellent stream. Thank you, community members for joining us today. Thank you, community staff, for hosting such an excellent chat. And thank you, Harry, for that wonderful presentation on the animation system. We will see you again next week. Catch you later, everybody. Peace out.